All right, welcome back to ABA exam review in our latest BCBA exam practice series. This is BCBA mock exam five. We're going to do the questions together. As always, if you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe for all of our updates. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials, including our combo pack. When you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. Let's get going. 51. A veterinarian accepts a job at a hospital that has more modern tools and systems compared to her old job. The veterinarian wants to familiarize herself with the hospital rooms and the tools in the hospital. What would be best to achieve this goal? Now, a lot of times we get very caught up in assessing the learner. We want to know everything there is to know about the learner, their behavior, how they react to things in the environment, so on and so forth. We can't neglect the other piece of the equation, which is the environment. Behavior is literally our reaction to the environment, the environment's effect on us, our reaction to the environment's effect on us. It's a give and take constantly with the environment. So the environment is just as important as the learner, because that's what we're going to try to change and manipulate and understand to better understand the learner's behavior. So with that said, we have a veterinarian who accepts a job at a hospital. It has more modern tools. It has different systems compared to her whole job. She, or the veterinarian, wants to familiarize herself with the hospital rooms and tools in the hospital. So what's going to be best to achieve this goal? Notice that she's not trying to familiarize herself with the patients or the coworkers, but the rooms and the tools and these systems, the environment she's going to be working in. How is she going to do that? What's the best way for her to do that? A, sit down with some of the other veterinarians who work there and ask them about their experiences. Now, what kind of assessment would this be? Well, it'd be indirect, right? They, she'd be sitting down with coworkers, getting secondhand information on their experiences. And that's going to be full of biases and learning history. And it's not going to be as accurate as a direct assessment, just like any other indirect assessment. B, conduct an ecological assessment of the hospital. Yes, an ecological assessment is simply an environmental assessment. If she's going to go through the hospital, get familiar with tools and systems and rooms and the environment she's working in, that's going to be a direct ecological assessment. It's a really smart thing to do. So in your case, as a future behavior analyst, when you get to, let's say, a client's home, don't just look at the individual. You need to examine everything about the home. What's the environment like? Is it noisy? Is it quiet? Is it dirty? Is it clean? How can you change the environment to better serve the learner? C, ask her boss to provide her with a handbook outlining rules and regulations. It would be helpful, the rules and regulations, but it's not going to give her a direct look at her environment she's going to be in. And then D, watch videos on the internet explaining the new equipment. Again, just knowing the equipment is not enough. Wouldn't it be better to actually see it in the actual environment she's going to be working in? So what's going to be best to achieve this goal? Well, conduct an ecological assessment of the hospital. Notice we always read every single answer choice. Knowing why the answers are wrong, just as important as knowing why they're correct. 52. A woman, who is also a behavior analyst, runs an in-home child care service and has used a reinforcement procedure to try and increase the children's rate of cleaning up after themselves, but has been unsuccessful. She has decided to use either an exclusionary timeout procedure or a non-exclusionary timeout procedure for her next intervention. How should the woman proceed? Now, how should this woman proceed? And a key is knowing she's a behavior analyst. And why is that important? Well, this is kind of like an ethical question. And when dealing with an ethical question, it's important to know if it's a behavior analyst or not. Because non-behavior analysts don't abide by our ethical code. They're just not held to that standard. That's not their code. If you are a behavior analyst, a BCBA or BCABA, you must follow this code. So knowing the woman as a behavior analyst gives us a lot of insight on her responsibility as far as ethics are concerned. So we know she's runs this child care service. She's used this procedure in the past, a reinforcement procedure, but it's, but it's unsuccessful. Okay, so she has to try something different. She says, I'm going to use either an exclusionary or a non-exclusionary timeout for my next intervention. So what's the next step? A, continue using the same reinforcement procedure in conjunction with the timeout procedure. Well, it's half right. If you're using punishment, we need something else with it, right? So she would need some sort of reinforcement procedure to go along with it to teach the replacement, 
but not the same one she's been using that isn't effective. That wouldn't make any sense. She knows it's unsuccessful. And in practice, when something's unsuccessful, we move on from it. B, it is more ethical to attempt an exclusionary timeout method first. Or C, it is more ethical to attempt a non-exclusionary timeout method first. Well, you tell me, what is more ethical? Exclusionary or non-exclusionary? Well, non-exclusionary, right? It's kind of like when we choose reinforcement first over everything else. It's just more ethical. Always when given the chance, you need to start with a non-exclusionary timeout procedure. It's just more ethical. It's less restrictive than an exclusionary timeout procedure. And then D, cleaning up after oneself is not socially valid and should not be targeted by this analyst. Now, cleaning up after oneself is important. It's meaningful. It's something you need to learn to do as a child, so to better serve yourself as you grow up, though it certainly is socially valid. How should she proceed? Well, she's not going to continue using the same procedure she's been using because it's not effective. First, she should try this non-exclusionary timeout method. If that's not effective, then maybe go on to the exclusionary method. 53. Clarence went on spring break and, since returning, has slacked off on practicing his clarinet. He wants to work back up to a reasonable amount of practice time, so he asks his partner to reinforce him only after he practices for 30 minutes. He then tells his partner to increase the practice time by 15 minutes each week. This most resembles what? Clearly, we have a differential reinforcement procedure here. And let's ask ourselves, are we teaching a replacement behavior? We're not. We're increasing a behavior, but it's not a replacement. So the two DR procedures that teach replacement behaviors are DRA and DRI. So if we're not teaching a replacement, get rid of both of those. Now, we ask ourselves, what are we attempting here? Well, uh, Clarence wants his partner to reinforce him after he practices for 30 minutes. And then each week, increase that by 15 minutes. So first, it'll be 30. And then he's got to practice for 45 and then an hour, so on and so forth. So what does that resemble? A, DRO. Well, DRO, we're reinforcing in the absence of a behavior. It's not the case here. Clarence has to play the clarinet to get reinforced. B, DRA. Well, we're not teaching a replacement, so it's not going to be DRA. C, DRL. Well, lower rates. We're not trying to lower the practice. We're trying to increase. Therefore, we're looking at D, differential rates or differential reinforcement of higher rates of behavior slowly increasing the necessary amount uh, that the learner needs to engage in the behavior, right? Higher and higher rates to slowly increase it. And that's what we're trying to do here. 30, then 45, then an hour, so on, so forth. 54, examine the chart below for an extinction procedure. What does the arrow next to the blue mark represent? And this is just, I like this chart a lot. Uh, it's just a great visual representation of extinction. It's from Cooper. And I think it's something you should just burn into your brain. You'll never mess up extinction if you remember this. Okay, so let's just break it down really carefully. You know, before we have our uh, condition change line, right, we've got our behavior, right? It's clearly just stable. It's being reinforced. And then what happens? Oh, we put it on extinction, right? And as we see, as extinction goes on, the behavior slowly increases. And then what happens? Well, we have a pop, right? We have a peak. And then it decreases. So this peak is what we're looking at. What is that peak? Well, clearly that's our extinction burst, right? Extinction starts. Behavior temporarily increases. Reaches a maximum. And then starts to decrease over time. Now, if we look down here, what happens? Well, suddenly the behavior is starting to increase again. Why is that? Well, spontaneous recovery or possibly resurgence, right? So most likely spontaneous recovery because we put it back on extinction. And what happens? It goes back down. So again, just a great chart as a visual for how extinction works. When you're teaching RBTs in the future, show them this or parents. It's just so easy to look at this and be like, that makes sense, right? The question is asking about the blue mark and the blue mark just represents what? Well, there are extinction bursts, right? We put the behavior on extinction. We hit the peak. We hit the burst. Slowly decreases once again. So our blue mark represents an extinction burst. 55, a behavior analyst expresses to a stakeholder that they would like to work on job skills so that the client can progress towards earning a job in the real world. What dimension does this represent? All right, our seven dimensions of ABA, right? Behavior, analytic, technological, conceptually systematic, applied, generality, 
and effective, okay? In this case, and dimension questions can be tricky because a lot of times there can be crossover. So you want to really look for the best answer here. You always want to look for the best answer, but especially in questions like this. We know the behavior analyst wants to work on job skills so the client can earn a job. Simple as that. Seems pretty meaningful, okay? So the dimension represented, is it analytic? Well, analytic says we have a functional relation. And we've yet to start anything. We're not manipulating anything. There is no IV. There is no DV yet. Okay. Possibly our DV will be job skills. We don't know yet. There's no functional relation. It's not analytic. Generality. Don't pick generality and don't be fooled. We want to progress towards that, obviously. But generality is saying, well, it's occurred. We haven't even started the intervention yet. So it can't have, couldn't have occurred. Okay. What we're looking for is applied. This is very applied. It's meaningful, socially valid. It's, it's important in this person's life. And then D, conceptually systematic. We're going to hope this analyst is conceptually systematic, but we know nothing about the intervention or what they're doing yet. So we can't say it for sure. All we know for sure is that working on job skills and progressing towards earning a job is applied. It's meaningful, it's socially valid, it's important. Inter observer agreement is primarily a measure of what? And when we think of data, we think of accuracy, validity, reliability, and inter-observer agreement. Each thing tells us something different, and all are very important for good data. So inter-observer agreement measures what, primarily? Does it measure accuracy? Well, no. Accuracy measures accuracy. Accuracy means we've measured the correct amount of whatever occurred. Inter-observer measures validity. No, validity is validity. It means we've measured the right behavior, right? What about believability? Yes, believability is inter-observer agreement. Because with inter-observer agreement, we've got two or more people agreeing on what was observed. And just because we have IOA doesn't mean it's accurate, doesn't mean it's valid, right? We just know it's believable. Because at least we have two or more people showing us that is the same thing. Okay, so IOA really measures believability. What about fidelity? Well, they can be doing it wrong and measuring the same thing, right? That doesn't mean it's the implement the intervention has fidelity. Okay, it just means they agree. The agreement just says, okay, it's believable about what was measured. Now, is it accurate? Is it valid? Is there fidelity? Is it reliable? Bob's teacher yells at him in class when he starts to talk to his classmates during a lecture. Bob now is quiet when his teacher is in the classroom, but will talk when his teacher is outside of the classroom. What best describes Bob's teacher? Careful here. Easy question, kind of tricky. What are we looking at? We're looking at Bob's teacher. Now, you're going to be quick to say, well, you know, when Bob starts to talk, right, the teacher yells at him, and now Bob is quiet. Pretty clearly, right, there's punishment going on. Sure. Is Bob's teacher the punishment or is the yelling? Well, the yelling is the punisher. Bob's teacher now signals to Bob that yelling is available, that punishment is available if he's talking to his classmates. So Bob's teacher is an SD for punishment, but she isn't a punisher. The yelling is a punisher. And that's really important that you know that distinction. Okay. If you understand this, then you're really, really starting to take it to the next level. Everybody knows, right, reinforcement increases, punishment decreases, right, and SD signals something is available. But if you can start to distinguish between those and discriminate between those within questions, now you're really moving up a level. The yelling is the punisher. Bob's teacher is the SD or the stimulus signaling that yelling is possibly available. So what best describes Bob's teacher? Well, A, a stimulus. Your children love to go to Target and Home Goods with you because they know they might get to buy toys. When walking through the aisles, they will point at something and say, can I buy that? This behavior represents what? Verbal operant. Okay, verbal operants. We want to know things like what evokes them, what reinforces them, point to point, and formal similarity. In this case, your children love to go to Target and Home Goods because they might get to buy toys. So already, what do we know? Well, we already know the motivation is high for buying toys, right? That's what they, they want. So they walk in, they're walking through the aisles, and then they point at something and say, 
can I buy that? Now, what evoked this question of can I buy that? Was it the, the thing or was it the motivation? Well, it was the motivation, right? The motivation to get this need or this want met. And the difference between attacked and demand is attacked is your ability to identify and label things in the environment. A man is the ability to express and get your wants and needs met. So while it's a little unclear, right, you know, was it the, the item that evoked it or the motivating operation, what the child is really trying to do is getting a need or want met. And therefore, it's going to be a man more so than attacked. We know motivation is there to buy. They see the item. And so the motivation is to get that want met, right? Clearly not an interverbal and echoic because there's no verbal SD evoking the behavior, okay? They're trying to get this want, the, 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 the need or this want to buy something met by manding to buy this item. The motivating operation evoked, can I buy that? So this behavior represents what verbal operant B Manned. James and his family play Monopoly together once a week. In Monopoly, your goal is to make money and acquire property. James likes to be the banker so that he can sneakily take extra money when no one is paying attention. This resembles what? So, we know that James is playing Monopoly with his friends, and the goal is to make money and acquire property, right? That's, so, these are the, the consequences. These are what you want to gain, right? These are the reinforcements. James wants to be the banker so he can take extra money when no one is paying attention. So when you are able to acquire reinforcement without engaging in the target behavior, what do we call that? A, a bribe. Well, a bribe is socially mediated, and this is not socially mediated, right? B, bootleg reinforcement. Yes, this is bootleg reinforcement. James is not engaging in the target behavior, okay? So he's getting reinforcement, but it's bootleg. C ratio strain. Well, we're not we're not thinning out any sort of reinforcement schedule here. And then D negative reinforcement. We're not taking anything away from James and increasing behavior. James is simply taking money, taking reinforcement without actually engaging in a target behavior. This resembles bootleg reinforcement. And 60 terminology that is specific to a particular profession or group of trained individuals is often referred to as what? You should avoid using this when communicating with parents of your clients. So we know when communicating with parents especially, we want to speak um, in a way that they understand. We want to speak on their level. And this goes for all stakeholders unless stakeholders are trained like us. Okay, We don't want to be showing off or trying to demonstrate how smart we are. We need to communicate in a way that they understand. So terminology that is specific to our profession is what? A, slang. Well, it's not slang, okay? There's, there's a different phrase we use for these this technical terminology, okay, that is particular to our profession or trained individuals. And it's going to be C, jargon. Non-technical language is what you want to use when discussing things with stakeholders. You still want to be objective, but you want to avoid jargon. Jargon is the terminology we use when talking amongst ourselves as behavior analysts or as ABA practitioners. You want to avoid jargon when talking with parents of your clients. Great. Check out behavioranalyststudy.com for all of our study materials. As always, when you pass, let us know. Work hard. Study hard. See you soon.